Hello, and welcome to this 2020 International Conference on Men's Issues Special Edition of Gender Matters, with your hosts, me, Mike Buchanan, and Elizabeth Hobson, respectively the founder and current leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them, as well as Belinda Brown. Belinda studied social anthropology at the London School of Economics and then lived in Warsaw, Poland for five years. At the Central European University, she studied the collapse of communism. She identified strong families and the social networks growing from them as playing a cru crucial role in bringing about the collapse of communism and wrote about this in her book, The Private Revolution. Belinda's talk title at this conference will be New Strategies and Directions for Ending Feminism. Our guest today, Mallory Millett, is one of the guests of honor at this conference and we're honored to interview her today. She has a CV or resume for our North American viewers, as long as your arm, and her profile on the conference website barely scratches the surface. I'll now read out just the first of the, of the five paragraphs that make up that profile. Mallory was the younger sister of the late Kate Millett, the radical feminist authoress of the highly influential Sexual Politics, 1970. Anne Coulter calls Mallory the single most important commentator on feminism in America. Her articles and interviews can be accessed at her website. In the 1970s, Mallory was deeply involved in communist activism with Kate and witnessed firsthand the founding of the second wave of radical feminism, which created the National Organization of Women, NOW, before she bolted to the right and voted for Ronald Reagan. End of website extract. Mallory is a devout Roman Catholic. Dr. Patrick Fagan, the Chair of Marriage and Family Studies at the Catholic University in Washington, DC, wrote this. As I have said many times, Mallory Millett's 2014 essay, Marxist Feminism's Ruined Lives, is the most important reportage of the 20th century because it leaves for history an insider's view of work that is well on its way to bringing down Western civilization. These highly intelligent, educated women were hell-bent on completing Marx and Engels' work by doing what so many, Lenin and Stalin included, could not do. Destroy the family and religion, the two biggest obstacle, obstacles to international materialist socialism. We'll put a link to Mallory's 2014 essay in the low bar, as well as a link to a recent very interesting interview Mallory had with regarding men, uh, with Paul Elam, Professor Janice Fiamengo and Tom Golden. Mallory, a very warm welcome. Elizabeth, Belinda and I will ask you just one question apiece but we know you'll have plenty to say in response to each. I've been speaking for way too long already, so mm -hmm. I'll now turn to Elizabeth to ask you the first question, and I'll ask the final question after Belinda. Thank you, Mike. So Mallory, in your recent interview for Regarding Men, you explained that Kate displayed mental health issues from a young age, including a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and much more. She was psychotic, profoundly paranoid, saw and heard things which weren't there, and she tried to kill you many times. It's, it's your contention that Kate was not crazy, but demonically possessed. You're quoted in Professor Paul Kengor's The Devil and Karl Marx as reporting that she had a black aura, which inspired me to scroll through images of her, and I did find them somehow chilling. But what I'm wondering, is whether her work and that of feminism more generally has made women of today more susceptible to mental illness. In the aggressive attacks on the family, a place statistically known for being the safest place for women and one which surely grounds many women and also in the cultural Marxist attacks on the feminine archetypes that our civilization has been losing. So I ask about that specifically because I've recently spoken to Martin Seeger about the mental health promoting effects of mm. supporting men and boys by appealing to what they are, seeing masculinity as archetypal, an expression of universal features that reside deep inside men and can't be easily or functionally changed, rather than stereotypical, 
which would suggest that masculinity can be fixed. And it occurs to me that perhaps the same is true of women. So where we used to have archetypes like St. Mary to look up to and aim to emulate, figures who represent love and nurturing and selflessness and grace, now such figures are presented as archaic and women are left with bewildering messages about virtually any behavior being acceptable or even productive as long as they're self-actualizing. But wouldn't this lack of guidance leave many of us adrift? Well, that is such a great question because one of the things that I'm most concerned about that really makes me, that it's made it so that I had to come out with all of this <clears throat> because I remained silent for years while I was being written about very slanderously in all of Kate's books. My older sister, Sally, was written about so uh, erroneously. I mean, the mendacity involved was just shocking. <clears throat> but you know, people who are involved with Marxism and the great revolution tend to live in a state of total delusion. They're all deluded about so many things. It's just mm -hmm. terrifying. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when I think back to the Kavanaugh hearings. Remember the Kavanaugh hearings uh, about the Supreme Court justice <laughs> some months back? Mm -hmm. Do you remember those crazy young girls pounding on the Supreme Court doors, hair mm -hmm. flying, yeah. uh, you know, fists flying, pounding on the Supreme Court doors uh, in, in a sort of a symbolic thing because they knew nobody was gonna open the doors for them. They were doing an act of theater for all of us, you know? And then they all followed uh, Senator Flake into the elevator and they uh, uh, just obnoxiously cowed this coward of a man, this absolutely idiotic man who should have stood up to them and told them to get the hell out of the elevator. Mm -hmm. um, what you're seeing there when you saw all that was my sister Kate metastasized. This, when I was a young person growing up, I never ever saw anyone behaving like my sister Kate. She was the only person in our whole world who ever behaved in that insane a manner like those girls. She was absolutely out of control. For, well, I, when I was born, she was five years old. And uh, she was, from the moment I was conscious of her, she was a completely uh, um, unpredictable, wild, frightening, violent person that I had to tiptoe through the house. So I had to avoid the terrible Kate, you know, because if she noticed me, I was in for it, you know? And uh, she, I was beaten up by her so much in my childhood. She tried to kill me so many times, but you see, we never saw women acting that way in public in America. That was just not, it just wasn't the way women were. But now it's 50 years after these people created this great adventure in that uh, room in the Greenwich Village where they had all their meetings founding now. And um, here we see, after my sister got her marching orders from the now founders, um, once they founded now, they, they made her the chairman of education. So she went around the United States of America uh, planting women's and gender studies classes in every college and university in the United States. And so for 50 years ongoing from 50 years ago till now, they've been establishing these women's and gender studies classes in all of the colleges and universities. We already had a problem with Marxism trying to get its wedge into our culture here in America. But once they founded those women's studies classes, it caught fire like a why a forest fire, wild forest fire gone completely crazy. I mean, now we see women uh, now in the rioting and the burning of towns and buildings that's going on in America right now, all at the hands of Marxists. These are all Marxists trying to create a Marxist revolution in America. We're seeing women, uh, the Black Lives Matter group is almost completely, as far as I can see, made up of young white women. So many young white women. They're, they're posting videos of themselves sitting in the front seat of their cars, all alone in a car, screaming, screaming, screeching, howling, wailing, carrying on. I mean, just using the F word over and over and over and over again, you know, just 
It's simply unbelievable. I never saw women act this way in my life until my sister came out and established these study groups and they all began to imitate this crazy behavior. Now I've got, I'm surrounded by millions of Kates, you know, everywhere. They're out of control. It, what amazes me, and, and, and my, my answer to your question is yes, mental health is become a very serious problem among women. I think if you take women and you remove them from marriage and you remove them from the consequences of their sexual acts, if you decide that um, sexual intercourse should not have to result in conception, that you're just going to uh, use your own body as a mu an amusement park and, and just fall into bed with any boy you, you fancy and just try to live like a man, you know, have the sex life of a man and just love him and leave him and have no concerns. And there's nothing sentimental or romantic about it. You're just going to be this functioning sexual creature um, that, that then if you end in pregnancy, then you can just throw the baby away, toss the baby into the garbage. Um, if you do this to women and you completely separate them from their natural role, which is perfectly clear. There's the masculine, there's the feminine. The men are men, the women are women. Let's stop kidding ourselves. Men do not become women. They're going to have Y chromosomes no matter what you do. You dig up a, a transsexual a thousand years from now and they do a DNA test on it, it's gonna come out a male. Uh, so uh, this is all fantasy. These people are all, and they're inviting all of America in on this fantasy with them, and they're managing to sort of sell it. But we have found that when you separate women from their consequences and from their natural role, what else are they going to do? These girls have nothing to do. They they have no. They when I was their ages, and when my generation were their ages, most of us were married and had a child or two. Uh, people had a home to run. They were they had a a man to take care of, and he took care of them. And, um, you know, it, I was kept very, very busy. When I was a young wife and mother, I was so busy. I couldn't be out burning down towns. I couldn't be out smashing people's cars and uh, accosting people in the streets and beating them up. Uh, there was no time for that sort of thing. You had to be down to the business of founding your family. And so this is the, the horror of having destroyed the family is that the women are out there with nothing to do but make noise and complain. And they're being led by terrible teachers. These professors, um, mm. all of these role models that are just God awful people. And, and, and you're, this is, I think we've got a serious mental health problem with the women in this country. And they're, they're seducing most women into this stuff now. This is a big problem. Uh, I, I, I really, uh, it's so interesting because it's so bizarre to have to be arguing the obvious all the time. I mean, here I am, I'm having to start out with shocking statements like men are men, women are women, and they're different from each other, and they're designed for, for different uh, functions. Oh my God, lock that woman up, stone her, throw away the key execute her, get rid of that woman. She's saying terrible things. It's, do you understand the nonsense that we're having to live through here? And we're having to spend our time arguing with this nonsense when, you know, there are very serious issues, very serious things that if people were just being what they're meant to be, men being men and women being women and, and just taking up our roles and doing them uh, for the love of God and, and for the, 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 the great, the great exercise of founding a family. Um, it, this, not, we would have really things to talk about. We would have political issues to discuss that are important and serious and that we have to solve. Meanwhile, in America, our towns are falling apart, our roads and highways are falling apart, our bridges, everything. Well, Nancy Pelosi is, is in the House of Representatives arguing about, you know, um, feminist issues, you know, whether getting more respect for women. Um, I find it just beyond ludicrous, mm -hmm. just beyond ludicrous. Mm -hmm. uh, in our household, we've been watching a series, a Spanish series 
we've been binge watching a Spanish uh, a soap opera, kind of a dynasty or Dallas called Velvet. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Velvet, but Velvet is in Spain and it's taking place in 1957, 58, you know? And it's just shocking because it's so much like America was then. The only, if they were all speaking English, it would just seem like a bunch of Americans in 1957, 58. It's so interesting. And the men are men, the women are women, the men are masculine, the women are feminine. Uh, and, and in that acting out of very serious and real life masculinity and real life femininity, they're such attractive people. And the men, by the way, have wonderful soft sides. They don't mind crying over the birth of their baby or crying over their love for their wife. And the women are very feminine and very strong. And when you sit back and really look with a perspective, you see actually that the women are controlling everything. The women pretty much run everything. The men are running around trying to please the women most of the time. And, and yet it, it, it's, it's a balanced society. And the guys are so attractive and the women are so attractive. And what we've given up here in, in, in this brave new world is that we've given up all of the wonderful things that go with that. Romance, flirtation, uh, 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 romantic dancing, uh, 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 the, the uh, what, what is it? Oh, we've killed humor. We have killed humor. We have killed yeah. sexiness. We've killed fun. We've killed yeah. uh, romance, flirting, dating. None of these things are going on anymore. And all the things that made life fun have been destroyed by these dour, crazy Marxists who won't let us have any fun, you know? So my, 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 I would recommend my, 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 Velvet. <laughs> I'm sorry, Valerie. I'm, I'm hesitant to uh, interrupt and be controlling. Um, but 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 we have another we have another two questions. So um, Elizabeth, is that okay? We move on to Belinda. Oh yes, thank you so much. That was such an interesting answer. And you know, it just reminds me. There's a Frank Zappa quote. He said that socialism creates bad art and very unhappy people. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. It's taken well, all without. The uh, I, I, thank sorry, you. Should, should I just read? Yeah, thank you. That was really that was really interesting, Mallory. Um, yeah, I'll I'll just tell you my question, which was um, which is so. Yeah, when I when I read the the book um, The Devil and Karl Marx by um, Paul Kenga, um, mm -hmm. it seems that one of the goals of communism um, was to destroy every shred of Christianity. Um, mocking the creed, the Bible, the faith, priests were killed, everything. And it was specifically Christianity, Marx wasn't so hostile to Islam, for example. Um, and feminism took this attempt to destroy Christianity one step further by destroying the family structure, which was and is a, a key mechanism in the transmission of Christianity. Um, even feminism's goal of destroying patriarchy seems to have an anti-Christian focus in that Christianity is based on the fatherhood of God. It seems to me that we'll require a return to Christianity in order to heal the damage caused by feminism. I don't know, what, 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 what do you think about that idea? Bingo. Yeah. That's what I say. Bingo. Well, that was a quick answer. <laughs> That's the whole deal. I mean, the minute you lose God, well, and I think probably uh, it wasn't so much a problem with Islam because um, back in the day, back in the 50s and all of that, um, Europe was, and America were mostly Christian. And, and we weren't having to deal with Islamism so much. It, it, you know, it's only come into the forefront since the terrorists got very, very active and um, and started invading our world and bombing our World Trade Center and, and all of that. We, we really, the Americans here were sound asleep about Islam. They, they, had, they didn't have a clue. I had lived in the Middle East for quite some time in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So I knew how dangerous these people were. And I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit embittered by the fact that when I left there, I thought I never have to deal with these people again in my life, thank God. And now I feel as if they followed me here, you know. Um, 
<clears throat> but um, when it comes to Christianity, you see, people say to me when they interview me a lot, they say, well, what are we going to do about all of this? I mean, how do we cancel out the effect of all these feminists? What, what, how can we uh, roll things back? Can we go back in time or can we, can we go forward with some, what do we do? And I always say, go out, fall in love, make a family and have children. That's how we combat this. We have to start making families like crazy. Everybody's got to go out and found a family right now because yeah. <clears throat> this is the whole deal. The, the atom in the structure of societies is the family. There's no getting around that. It, they, you know, when these people conspired with each other, when Marx and Engels were conspiring with each other, when the Frankfurt School were all in Germany conspiring with each other, the number one issue was smash the family, destroy the family. If, until we destroy the family. So the number one thing was to do that, to uh, liberate women. Yes, wow, what a wonderful thing. Uh, put them on, all in factories and let them not have their children and put their children on big farms where strangers are raising them. Uh, that's, that's I, you know, these ideas are so insane. And I recommend all of you to read The Devil and Karl Marx, Paul Kenger's book, because he really, really puts it out there. There's so much demonic possession involved in all of this. Satan is really going after us now, now that we've decided to get rid of the family and to, you know, pick up all these socialistic ideas. So the thing is that, you know, the template for the family in, in Christian life <clears throat> has always been the manger, the, the Jesus and Mar I mean, Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. That's, that's our template, is that little triangle, is the mother and the father and the children. And um, <clears throat> when Kate, when Kate uh, uh, devised her concept of sexual politics, what she, what she created was a, a, a course in Marxist 101, Marxism 101. And in that uh, template uh, that Kate created, and it is that the man is the, the reason it's a Marxist group or a, a, an oppressive slave group, the family, is that the man is the bourgeoisie and the women and the children are the proletariat. And they're the slaves of the man in all of this business. This is such nonsense. My way of combating that is to bring up a, a discussion about Man as the slave of woman. Let's talk about man as the slave of woman. For centuries and centuries and centuries, the man has been the woman's slave. The woman uh, held reign over the household with the children, but that was pretty much her, her territory, you know? And uh, she would have a beautiful nest for the man to come home from his slavery to and have a, a hot meal ready for the family. And that was her thing, but she could pretty much be her own boss all day long within the home. I remember my mother used to take a nap and a long bath in the afternoons. And, you know, how many women are able to do that now? But the men are, are were working as, as the slaves of the women in, um, I've written down this list, in, in the um, uh, factories, mines, fields, uh, uh, all of the, the work spaces, uh, uh, the factories, mines, fields, corporations, offices, politics, the armies, the small businesses and shops. The men were out slaving all day long to put a roof over the family's head and keep them clad and keep them fed. That was what has gone on forever and ever and ever. I don't really see anything so much about the woman and the children being the slaves of the man. My my perspective is that the man was the slave of the family. And uh, now the family has become a chaotic mess because mom has grabbed a briefcase and she's running out to run the world in competition with dad and nobody's running society. Um, but society, if we all manage to go back to Christianity, if we manage to reconvert and have some kind of a revival of Christianity, where people begin to understand that the home is the first church. The mother runs the home. She teaches the 10 commandments to the children. They're learning them from earliest childhood. Um, 
they're, they're going through a big gala Christmas every year with the family, with Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the manger. And, and this is our, our model. Um, we can bring ourselves back to health. If we make God our patriarch, we, if we make God our, our, our focal point and Christianity our method where we uh, attend church and we do the sacraments or whatever, you know, there are many different forms of Christianity, but uh, this is the most important thing we can do is to bring back Christianity and Judaism because Judaism is very, very important. They also teach their children the Ten Commandments. Um, Mallory, uh, Kate's book, Sexual Politics, was published in 1970 when she was 36. And not long after, she publicly declared herself a lesbian. The first chapter consists mainly of scenes in books by Henry Miller and Norman Mailer, in which men dominate and abuse women, mainly sexually, but also otherwise. And in one of the books, the main character kills his wife before having sex with the wife of a friend. In the preface, Kate claims these were random contemporary literary descriptions of sexual activity, but of course they were anything but random. She critiques the scenes as if they were typical of the everyday lives of men and women in America. And on that ridiculous foundation, she proceeds to build her theories of sexual politics and patriarchy right. in the second chapter. She also writes this in the preface. This second chapter, in my opinion, the most important in the book and far and away the most difficult to write, attempts to formulate a systematic overview of patriarchy as a political institution. Much here and throughout the book is tentative and in, and in its zeal to present a consistent argument has omitted, though it need not preclude, the more familiar ambiguities and contradictions of our social arrange, arrangements. End of extract. Mallory, in your view, how could such an obviously flawed and toxic book have had so much influence in America and beyond following its publication half a century ago? You know, you have to take this in context. You have to remember what was going on in America in 1958, 59, uh, in 1960, 61. Uh, the, these um, things were, were starting to come into our, the fabric of our, of our culture. But then when it got to be 1968, 69, it began to go out full blown uh, uh, demonstrative uh, craziness. The, um, uh, the 1968 uh, Democratic Convention in Chicago became, it was just like what's going on now in America. Riots broke out. Riots were all over the city of Chicago. Um, these uh, uh, people like the hippies and the yippies and all of these people were making themselves very well known and causing a lot of trouble. Um, they were desperate for George McGovern to become president of the United States. He was quite a serious act activist socialist. And so those people were doing right what they're doing now. It's the same group, it's the same crowd, the Marxists making all kinds of wild, violent trouble all, all over the country and particularly in Chicago during the Democratic Convention. So that this was an atmosphere that was going on and was, was, was um, bursting forth in America. Um, when um, uh, people like Angela Davis and Bobby Seale all of these people that were part of something called the Chicago Seven that came out of that Chicago uh, convention, uh, they were all put on trial for their activities during that time. And there was a big show trial, it was a huge thing. My sister sat at the defense table every single day during Angela Davis's trial. And she was a real piece of work. She's still some big professor in some school out West. She's a big deal. You know, all these people just get put to work you know, uh, teaching our children, this is the worst thing. Is it, you know, uh, Bernadine Dorn and, and all of those people are teaching our children now uh, because they don't remain in jail. These people need to be in jail. They need to be taken out of society. But anyway, this whole thing was exploding across the country. By 1970 and 71, I was going to these 69, 70, 71, I was going to these meetings about the National Organization for Women. And this was now congealing. Now all these women were meeting and they were starting this whole thing and, and they were wanting to do the gay 
movement. They were wanting to, uh, 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 you know, uh, liberate the homosexuals. Um, when these women were sitting around a table in Greenwich Village in 1969 to, to form now, you know, they would start out their meetings with a kind of a litany, you know, the chairwoman would say, why are we here today? And the women, there'd be like 12 to 14 women, they would call out to, to do the revolution, what kind of revolution she would ask, a cultural revolution. And, and what do you mean by that? Well, you know, they would answer back and forth. Uh, how do we make the revolution? We make the revolution by destroying the family. How do we destroy the family? You destroy the patriarchy, they would shout. And how do you destroy the patriarchy? She would ask, and they would say, by promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, abortion, and homosexuality. So these women had their marching orders. They went out, Kate was sitting at that table. She had just written sexual politics and it just exploded. It was a bestseller. Everybody was buying sexual politics and reading it. And this, all this stuff, you know, uh, congealed all at the same time, these things uh, started happening. In 1969, uh, 19, uh, yes, in 1969, we had Woodstock. Woodstock was an enormous thing that, that started this whole uh, cultural pop culture kind of thing where they were just worshiping rock music and everybody was becoming hippies and yippies. And uh, uh, this, this was the atmosphere that sexual politics came out in. And it was part of the, the um, ins it was one of the instigators of all of this stuff exploding. So that when Kate was made chairman of education for the National Organization for Women, her first action was to get on planes and trains and automobiles and go all over the United States founding women's studies courses. She founded women's studies courses in every college and university in the United States, gender studies and, um, where then she would teach your daughters. This, these were basic tenets that she taught your daughters. Be an outlaw. Be a damned outlaw. Don't care what is the law anymore. The law is useless. Break every law you can. Um, um, laws were made by dead white men uh, and they're irrelevant. We need to make a whole new society. So be an outlaw. Be a damned outlaw and be completely defiant uh, toward the culture and toward civilization. And, and number two was be a slut. Be a slut and be proud of it. Be proud of being a slut. Exert your independence as a sexual creature. You're allowed to have sexual intercourse with anybody you want, anytime you want. And, and if you get pregnant, you could just have an abortion. So there's, we don't need to worry about those things anymore. So uh, there are young girls now, you know, on, on Amazon right now, if you look it up on Amazon, they have a seven-year-old girl uh, modeling a t-shirt that has daddy's little slut on it. Daddy's little slut. It's on Amazon. You can look it up. And there's a little eight-year-old girl there modeling it with a big smile on her face. You know, this, these people are actually selling this to your children. Now, a lot of people are so shocked at this stuff. They don't believe it. They, they say, oh, come on. They, they're, they're not. Yes, yes, yes. They're teaching your children that uh, sodomy, you know, they're, they're, they're getting out bananas and all kinds of different things and showing them, uh, uh, imitating the sexual act and showing them how to, how to use contraception and, and preaching abortion and, and all of this. This is what's going on when they have sex education for six and seven year olds. This is what they're teaching them. And they're teaching them that a little boy who thinks he's a girl at the age of eight should start changing right now he should start changing over i mean can you imagine anything so ludicrous as this and and the fact that the women are all working now nobody has time for their children's homework they they're running in and out of the house with a briefcase they throw together a dinner of pizza and coca-cola or something nothing is done properly anymore in the home we've developed the most terrible group of kids all these tattoos these these are uh, uh, rioters, these uh, uh, everybody's overweight, ill-mannered. Uh, uh, the, 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 the young people in society are just the worst two generations we have ever put forth in this country have come out of these women. Um, so uh, uh, I, I would say that um, 
Now, wait a minute. I've lost the thread of what the original question was. Uh, you're wanting to know about um, uh, the context and why this all, why sexual politics became so popular. It, it became popular, so popular because it was, it was that period, that whole period just sort of exploded and took over. And sexual politics just happened to be published right at that time. And, and you know, uh, it gave women a big uh, uh, out, you know, it, it gave them an out for all the consequences of any bad behavior. It used to be if you got pregnant when you were unmarried, it was a, appalling and it was shocking. And, you know, you had to, you know, uh, either get married or go off and have the baby and put it up for adoption. And, and people thought that was appalling and terrible. So this was their cure. Their cure was, oh, great. Now women don't have to be tied to biology anymore. Uh, they can be just as casual and irresponsible as men. And the men, in the beginning, you know, the men did not like it. When we did the big women's march in New York City in 1969-70, I think it was 1970-71, right there, we all marched up Fifth Avenue, thousands and thousands of women. I mean, it was an enormous march in New York City. And, you know, Fifth Avenue goes down, the traffic goes down. So we marched up. It was just, you know, even that, everything is symbolic with these people. And uh, th there were huge crowds lined on either side. You'd have thought it was the Thanksgiving Day Parade uh, because there were just enormous, enormous banks of people watching this march. And so many of them were men and we were marching for abortion. We had big signs, abortion now, and uh, abortion must be legalized. And these guys were throwing stuff at us. They were throwing rotten tomatoes and oranges and objects. They were throwing things at us and calling us sluts and saying, you know, go back to the kitchen. And they were, they were completely against abortion. The men were absolutely against abortion. But once we got a toehold and sexual politics was read by everybody and the women's studies courses started taking hold and everything, the men suddenly went, whoa, whoa, what are we crazy? Why should we be against this? If I get a girl pregnant, gosh, what am I nuts? Let her go have an abortion. I don't want to have to support some illegitimate kid for the rest of my life. You know, gee, now I'm getting off the hook myself. And so the men started really going for it. You know, I always say that this whole thing happened on the pillows in dormitories in America where the pillow talk was, hey, buddy, if you don't agree that I can have an abortion, if I get pregnant here right now, what the two of us are about to do, if I get pregnant, I'm going to have an abortion. The, the guys, you know, you know, young guys, they'll agree to anything to to, to get laid, you know, that's, that's the whole deal is a guy's got to get laid in college. So it, it, it just all worked in synchrony, you know, all of it together to create this thing where now, I mean, I will go places and people will come up to me and say, oh, I hear you're Kate Millett's sister. And I say, yes, I am. And they, she, they start going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I worship her. Oh, she's my ideal. I love her. Oh, you, you were Kate Millett's sister? You grew up in the same bedroom with her? Oh my gosh, oh, well, you must be so wonderful. I mean, and I just blow their balloon right, right up, all right? I just say, look, you're, you're, you're marching to the wrong tune here. You don't know what you're talking about. This woman is a mentally ill person. She's shepherded a whole lot of other young women into being mentally ill. I, I can't get over how many people are bipolar all of a sudden. All of a sudden, the whole world is bipolar. No, these are just people who, who've lost a sense of civilized behavior. They don't know how they're supposed to behave anymore. They've lost the book of rules. They don't follow the Ten Commandments. They've all stopped going to church. And... Uh, they, and and they, what they need to be doing is going out and finding great young guys and starting families so that they can have a healthy life. I feel there is pushback happening. Do you think, do you sense any pushback in the States against all of this? Oh, oh, I'm going to go way out on a limb here because it's supposed to be so tight and nobody seems to know what's going to happen. But uh, when you see how Donald Trump is reelected, you're going to see the pushback. 
People are, you know, I have some friends who run a trunking, trucking company and they've been out driving trucks all around the United States for the last two months because we're here quivering in terror that Joe Biden's going to get elected. And they're all saying he's way ahead in the polls and he's going to get elected while he's hiding in a basement somewhere. And Trump is out going to crowds of 12 to 30,000 people. I mean, uh, I hear that Barack Obama gave a speech the other day and something like 37 people showed up to hear Barack Obama. Uh, Joe Biden gets no crowds. He had a thing where he was gonna talk to cars and something like 30 cars showed up and that was it. Uh, but with, with uh, uh, Donald Trump, we're getting these massive rallies, massive crowds. Now my friends in the trucking business said, Mallory, we just spent two months driving around America. And she just said this last week. And we saw nothing but Trump signs. The entire country is covered with Trump signs. We never saw any Biden signs at all. And I'm going, oh, come on, you know, that's that can't possibly. No, we really, until we reached New Jersey, that's when we started seeing a couple of Biden signs. In total, we might have seen 10 Biden signs. They're just not out there at all. And so I am hoping that the polls are as wrong this time as they were four years ago, and that we're going to have a red tsunami wave because um, what we need is more of Donald Trump. Absolutely, this man is a wholesome individual with a beautiful family who has five kids, who has five kids and not one of them is a drug problem, an alcohol problem, a behavior problem. Every one of these five kids of his are just kids that anybody would want as their sons or daughters. And um, uh, he, he, you know, people say, oh, well, I don't like the way he behaves, right? I, don't, I, th I always say, what are you talking about? He's a regular American guy. He sits down and he talks to us the way guys talk to each other in bars and restaurants, the way we all talk when we're in each other's living rooms, when we're in bowling alleys and riding in our cars. This is the way we talk to each other. And he's just a regular American person. You know, George Washington had a, the fantasy that the, the people who ran the politics, the president and vice president, the people who ran the country would be regular civilians who would just give up their life for four years to be president and then go back to the farm the way he himself did, Washington did, the way, the way that Jefferson did. Not these career politicians like Biden who stay in the business for 47 years. You know, he's never had a regular job in his life. Joe Biden has never had a private sector life in his life. He's lived off of the American taxpayer for 40, 47 years. And all he's done is damage. He's done great damage to black people. He's great, done great damage to the country, to our criminal justice system all over the place. I mean, the guy is really a menace. And um, uh, that, that's what Donald Trump, he's, he's a citizen American who gave up his life to go and do this for eight years and he'll go back to his regular life after eight years. And that's what George Washington fantasized. That's what he hoped for. He wrote about this, you know, he doesn't want these career politicians. So I think that we're gonna see, cross your fingers and pray to God that uh, Donald Trump gets reelected and uh, we can continue on with his program because uh, I think there's huge pushback. People are fed up with this behavior, mm -hmm. totally fed up. Do you want your business burned down, your town burned down? I keep laughing to my, my liberal friends and saying, oh yeah, America's gonna vote for the people who are burning down the towns and villages in the country. This is what we want is chaos, you know? Okay. Um, um, I think we're, we're sort of coming towards the end of our time, sadly. Um, you said there was something you wanted to, to, to bring well, up. Well, that, that was kind of it when I talked oh. about the man as the woman's slave. I wanted to talk about that's my new issue. That's my new thing that I'm trying to, to, to point out, make, make clear to people that the man was always the slave of the family, not necessarily the woman. You know, uh, he was caught in whatever, you know, he had to go down in the mine every day for 30 years to keep those mouths uh, fed and the roof over somebody's head, you know, uh, he had to go to, out into the fields and it was pretty much the man's job to do well, that. I want to bring up the fact that um, 
there's, uh, uh, we have a channel called EWTN, Eternal Word uh, Television Network, EWTN. And uh, they are showing a documentary right now. There was a part one called A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, part one. And it was the story of Saul Alinsky. I don't know if you guys in England know who Saul Alinsky is, but he was the father of community organizing. He's Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama honed their political skills on Saul Alinsky. And he was a very big piece of damage that came to our country. Um, so that was uh, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, part one, Saul Alinsky. Now the same movie makers, Arcadia Films, Richard and Stephen uh, Payne, uh, made a part two, and it's called A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, part two, The Gender Agenda. And it's all about this gender agenda thing with the trannies and the transsexualism and all of that. I always joke and say, you know, if Kate were uh, 19 years old right now, Kate would be transitioning. She'd be growing a beard. She'd be doing the whole thing, trying to become a man, I, I promise you. But in this um, A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, part two, The Gender Agenda, I'm one of the main commentators in this movie. It's a gorgeous movie. It's a two hour feature length documentary and it is so spectacularly made. I can't tell you the photography is phenomenal. It's just great. And so what, look out for what, that. And what, where will people find it, Mallory? It's A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, part two, The Gender Agenda. And it's on EWTN, Eternal Word Television Network. It's okay, a, okay, we'll, 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 we'll find, okay. Uh, is it only on cable, Mallory, do you, do you happen to know? I believe so, yeah. Well, okay. no, I well, no. You can probably access it other ways. Okay, we'll, no, we, we, we'll Google it and and, uh, and yeah. hope to find it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also, be sure to go to my website, which is MalloryMillet.com. My husband's always telling me that I have to remember to say that because I I go on shows constantly and forget to say my website, MalloryMillet.com. No, it's, it's it's a great website. I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed looking at it. Um, Elizabeth and Belinda, anything before we before we wrap up? Well, that was really interesting. Thank you very much for you know sharing sharing your thoughts with us. I really enjoyed that. So thank you. Um, well, it's been a real joy to be with the three of you. Thanks so much for all the stuff that you're doing to try to make our world healthier. We all have to work very hard for to get back to wholesome, wholesome, down to earth human behavior. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for your time, Mallory. Thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been a real honor for us. And um, I think it's a wrap. Okay. <laughs>